yele po zinta ya li kada da ye kete yele po zinta ya li brada ya li ke zinta ya. We worship you, Jesus, Father. We reference your name, li brada ya li ke zinta ya li yele de. Mali yele po soto ye li brado shreke de yele po zinta ya li kada da. Jeke de yele po zinta ya li kada shubi kata ya li ke zinta ya li yele de. Lord, we worship you. Father, we give you praise. We give you praise. Welcome, people. Welcome. Welcome to today's um, sixth day of uh, matrimonial healing. Let us go ahead and begin to bless the name of the Lord for today, for the days that the Lord has done with us. I would want us to start by blessing the name of the Lord from the very first day, from the very first day, every session, every day. Let's go ahead and begin to exalt the name of the Lord. Father, we worship you, Jesus. We give you praise. We hallow your name. There is none like you. Thank you, Almighty Father. Thank you, King of Glory. We, 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 we plan this program with you, and you are showing up for us. We can beat our chest and say, yes, the Lord came through for us as far as matrimonial healing 2021 is concerned. The Lord came through for us. We saw his end. We saw his move. It has been awesome. It has been loaded. It has been power packed. Father, we bless you. Father, we bless you. We give you praise. You can just raise any, any song from your heart in your closet to appreciate the name of the Lord. Just speak any song and magnify the name of the Lord with your song. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He has done great things. That is our testimony, Lord. You have done great things for us. You have done great things. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to go ahead and bless the name of the Lord for every minister that the Lord has used. I want us to bless the name of the Lord for every man of God, every woman of God that the Lord has used in blessing us, in ministering to us, in delivering the mindset of the Lord, undiluted. During this program, since we started on Monday, I want us to bless the name of the Lord for Pastor Shevon Koka and, and Mr. Shalakwe Koka. I want us to, to bless the name of the Lord for every man. The, the man of God that minister on, on, on Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday. I want us to bless the name of the Lord for every couple, individual, all together that have been here to testify. To testify to, to, to loving in hard times, loving in tough times. For every home that the Lord has used in blessing us, and majorly, I want us to lift our voice and bless the name of the Lord for our big daddy in the Lord, Pastor Larry Adeboye. Last night was, was the peak of everything. Last night was awesome. I want us to bless the name of the Lord for being God. Father, we worship you. Lord, we appreciate you. We thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for speaking to us. When, when, as I was preparing for this meeting today, what came to my mind was the story of that uh, Samaritan woman that when Jesus met at the well, and when Jesus saw that things that were happening, she went to the into the city and she started calling people that come and see this, come and see this strange man that that, has, that is telling me that told me all that I have done. The Lord has sent men of God. The Lord has sent his children to speak to us. Majority of us, we cannot deny the fact that some things that we were struggling with, some things that we've been battling with, were addressed as if, they, as if the man of God speaking was right there under our roof. Because the Lord has been so mindful of every hope, because the Lord has been so mindful of every couple, of every individual. That was why he sent his, his word raw, undiluted. Let's bless the name of the Lord. God, we bless you. Father, we give you praise. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. We can't thank you enough, oh Lord. We, we cannot thank you enough. I want us to bless God for, for school of virtue. There is one thing I know about us. 
And whenever we are planning a program, the Lord will tell us how the program is going to go, how the program is going to be. And at the end of everything, we will see the handwriting that, yes, this is God's own. This is God's things. Let's bless them of the Lord for school of virtue, that the fact that God is mindful of us in this ministry, for the fact that God is always on our case in this ministry, for the fact that God is ever ready to hear us in this ministry. For there is nothing, I have not seen it. There is nothing we, we, we plan doing, either small or big, that we not back the, 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 the confirmation that yes, God is in this thing with us. Let us bless God for always being in this thing with us. For always being in this thing is in, with us. Father, we worship you. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Almighty Father. We celebrate you. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. We are going to quickly pray and commit to give into the hands of the Lord. Our Father, this is another, another opportunity has come for us. For us to learn and relearn and relearn and learn. Lord, come and speak to us in the name of Jesus. This evening, Lord. Lord, you will speak through your the speaker. You will speak through your daughter. Lord, you are going to take away anything that you are not sending her. She's going to come here and deliver that which you want us to know in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will speak through your daughter in the name of Jesus. This evening again, Lord, we have come. We have come full of expectation. Lord, and you say, the expectation of the righteous of God will not be cut off. Lord, we have come to you. Our expectation concerning parenting, not only about caring children, concerning parenting at life. Our expectation is not going to be cut short, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, our expectation, Lord, will not be cut short in the mighty name of Jesus. And I want us to pray that every parent, as many parents that are here, as many parents that will be hearing us, maybe on Mixeller, that will be watching us on YouTube, that will be joining us on Facebook, whichever platform they'll be joining us from. But every parent that is already weary, every parent that is, every parent, any parent that is already weary and already discouraged about a particular child, let us pray that today will be a turning around for them. They'll receive encouragement through, through this evening ministration in the name of Jesus. Lord, every parent of any child that is erring, any child that is disobedient, some parents are just crying. They, they, they've just got it so not because they don't know the way forward again. Lord, we pray for God. Today, today, this evening, oh God, we mark a turning point in the life of that child, in the life of that mother, in the life of that father, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. And lastly, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for, for prayer. You know, one thing about this, about marriages, some, some couple, like husband and wife, may not really have issue with themselves. They may not have their personal issue that is making the house to be on fire. Some houses are, are on fire because of the children in that house, because of a particular child that is disobeying, that is bringing shame to them. We're going to pray hope for that. as many of them that are going to stumble on this program, as many of them that are coming into this meeting. Lord, let's speak, reach out to them through your daughter. In the name of Jesus, let there be an express ministration that we encourage their hearts something they will pick up from here and they will, they will implement and there will be testimony in the name of Jesus. Father Lord, we we'll pray, oh God, that this will be our story and we shall come back home rejoicing. Thank you, eternal Father. Shall we just go ahead and begin to give God praise? We we'll celebrate you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. We are so sure that you, you, you have come again for us today. In the name of Jesus, we are very sure that you're going to speak to us and we shall be blessed. And we will raise generations that will serve the Lord. Generation children that will serve the Lord, that will love the Lord all the days of their life. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Hey, Amen. Thank you, people of God, for joining in again. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are joining us from, whatever your time zone is, we are welcoming you once again to Matrimonial Healings Week 2021, to the glory of God, and it has been so awesome. Today is the sixth day, and by the special grace of God, we are doing something about parenting. 
You know, we've been talking about couples, about our relationship with our husband, with our wife. But this evening, by the special grace of God, we are taking it further to talk about parenting. And with us, with us this evening, the speaker today is a mother of two and a wife. She is a founder of Parenting Grace. She immigrated to Canada a few years ago where she currently lives with her family. Fumi is passionate about parenting and education. She has 15 years of experience working with children and teens, both in Nigeria and in Canada. She supports families through her parenting workshops and coaching equipment with uh, parenting tools and strategies for overcoming day-to-day -day parenting challenges while raising responsible and value-based children. She is certified in positive discipline parenting education and a member of the Positive Discipline Association, North America. Professionally, she is a data analyst and a project management professional working She's currently working in the education sector in Harbata, Canada. She is an unapologetic lover of God. People, I believe your notepad is ready to jot down, and I believe you have your pen with you. In case you don't have, you can quickly hurry up to go and pick your daughter and your pen because the Lord will be sending his word. Please, with Jesus God in your heart, wherever you are, and you just please put your hands together as I welcome to the podium, Mrs. Fumi Alagbe. Mrs. Fumi Alagbe, you're welcome. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, awesome. I'm so glad to be here today. It's my pleasure joining everyone with this uh, matrimonial week that we have been, um, we started over since uh, Monday, it's been awesome. I was able to join a few of the sections, but I thank God for what God is doing. So I'm happy and excited to be here. And I thank God for everyone that has also joined us here. Thank you for making our time to be at this meeting today. Yeah, will I be able to share my screen, I believe right now? Can you hear me still? Are you able to hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. I, I, the admin will do. The admin will make you share your screen. Okay, good. All right. You you can see. Yes, we can see your screen now. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm so glad to be here to be talking to us about parenting. It's a topic that is there to my heart. And thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. I think I don't need any more introduction for myself. You've done it all. And uh, before we go into today's uh, program, I want to take this opportunity to appreciate the visionary of this ministry, Pastor Shegun Koka and his wife, Mr. Sholak Koka, for the great work that they're doing and for what God is doing through them. It's been amazing. And I thank God for, for their life. I remember 17 years ago, I had the opportunity to start the School of Virtue chapter in Obafemi Awolowo University for shortly before I left school. And over the years, I've had the opportunity to counsel at the National Ladies Camp meeting, such an important and incredible work. And I really love doing that. I miss doing that actually. So it's a pleasure to be here and to be a blessing to the people of God. Thank you for inviting me over. I do appreciate that. So without wasting more time, I want us to go into our presentation for today. Uh, well, I need no more introduction. I'm going to skip that. So uh, yeah, I currently live in Canada and we do workshops and trainings and seminars and all that. Here are a few of the workshops that we have done in time past. And uh, yeah, so a few of the workshops that we have done in time past. And I want to thank God for, the, for that opportunity. But before COVID, we were able to meet in person. But after COVID, um, things happen. We cannot meet in person again. We have to go virtual. And that's probably one of the opportunities uh, technology has given unto us to be able to reach people far and wide. So I'm so glad and happy to be here today. Um, 
Today, we're going to be looking at uh, why children uh, err. First of all, we'll be understanding why children misbehave. And uh, we'll look at how parents likely contribute to misbehavior. And then we'll be teaching about a concept called the belief behind the behavior using iceberg as an analogy. And then I'll be sharing with you some strategies, tools for success. And then hopefully we'll have time for questions and answer at the end of the presentation. I always like to start with a quote. And this quote is from Jody McBeatty. And it says that um, young people will grow up in families that they perceived as both kind and firm and will feel a sense of connection are more likely to be successful academically and less likely to engage in risky behaviors such as smoking, alcohol, drugs, and violence. The emphasis here for today will be on connection. That's why that is popping out. I kind of highlighted that. We'll be looking at that connection piece because as we go on, you will see the importance of connection in helping our children to be successful and helping them to overcome misbehavior. And also the tools and strategies that I'll be sharing with us today. I'm happy to tell you that they, they are both kind and firm tools. And then we'll talk more about that as we go. Now, why do children misbehave? I believe that for us to understand uh, why children misbehave, before we even start to say, how do we handle misbehavior? We need to understand why children misbehave. So there are a number of reasons why children misbehave. Oh, on the first, understand this, we need to go into the concept of human behavior. Let's, we need to look at the psychology of human and the behavior, whether the, the person is a child or the person is an adult. What is the psychology? What is, the, what is the, that concept of human behavior? So there is a quote by Dr. Thomas Gordon. Dr. Thomas Gordon is a, an American clinical psychologist and is widely recognized as a pioneer in teaching communication skills and conflict resolution skills for parents, teachers, and leaders. And he has this to say, he said, children don't misbehave. They simply behave to get their needs met. They simply behave to get their needs met. Emphasis on the word needs. What are those needs? We'll be looking more closely into that. So the, the misbehavior that we see is oftentimes nothing more than a lack of knowledge or a lack of effective skills in communicating a deep-seated need. I'll say that again. Misbehavior that we often see in the surface is nothing more than a lack of knowledge or a lack of effective skills in communicating a deep-seated need. There's that need somewhere. And this misbehavior we know could manifest in various forms that we see. For younger children, you could see tantrums, crying, sometimes lying, and as they grow up, you see more complex misbehavior, fighting, disobedience to authority, you know, destroying properties, stealing, sexual immoralities, violence, smoking, alcohol, and all that. So that's what we see in the surface. But this, there is a need that every child is trying to communicate to us. So the primary goal of every human being is to belong, and to be significant. I want you to take note of that because we'll be also talking a little bit about that belonging and significance. The primary goal of every human being, children inclusive, is to feel the sense of belonging and that sense of significance. So the goal of all behavior is to achieve that belonging and significance within a social environment. So misbehavior is based on a mistaken belief about how to achieve that belonging and significance. And when I mean belonging, I mean connection, that connection. And significance means the quality of being worthy of attention. 
feeling that sense of importance and ability to be able to contribute. So that's what I mean by significance. So every human being on earth, wherever you might be, there is that primary need to feel a sense of belonging and to feel a sense of significance. And here's another quote by Rudolf Dracos, and one of the founding fathers of positive discipline. And he says that a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. A child needs encouragement like a plant needs water. Now, if we, we plant a seed and we don't water it, it's not going to thrive. It's not going to thrive. So the basis of most misbehavior that we see is discouragement. And how do we encourage children to be successful, to do better? Because the basis of those misbehavior those things that we see and we call this is a problematic child, the basis is that that child is discouraged. Discouragement based on the feeling that they don't belong or they are not significant. So this will take us to look into more detail the belief behind the behavior using the iceberg uh, analogy. This is a concept that we teach in our parenting workshops and we take enough time to dwell into onto this to break it down very well. I'm going to do my best to, to with it, within the time we have to just uh, hinge on those concepts, the important concepts about uh, belief behind behavior. Now, many of us might have seen um, Iceberg, maybe in TV or in movies, if we, because may, you might not be living in a cold region. But when we see Iceberg, what we see on the surface is only small compared to what is beneath the surface. And you can see beneath the water surface, there's a huge body of ice that is not seen on the surface. I remember watching the movie Titanic and how it crashed, it hit an iceberg. You know, it's something, something just small on the surface. Nobody will have thought that there's something big underneath. Okay, so I'm gonna use this analogy to explain to us the belief, the concept about belief behind the behavior. So there is a belief behind every behavior. There is always, always a belief behind every behavior. Now look at this picture of the iceberg. What we see in the surface is that, behave, is that behavior that the child is displaying or an adult, because this concept is applicable to both children and adults. So on the surface, we see a child that is throwing tantrums, a child that is stealing, a child that is lying, or a child that, that is disobedient. We see that on the surface. But beneath the water surface is the belief behind the child's behavior. And deep down, you will see that primary need, the need for belonging and significance. Most times, children don't know how to communicate this need for belonging and significance. Even adults don't know. They may not even know the reason why they're misbehaving. So the work lies with us to, uh, parents to be able to improve our own knowledge, to be able to recognize what the coded message that this child is trying to, to, to communicate to us, that deep-seated need. But then they have a made up a mistaken belief about this is what I can do to get what I want. But that's actually often wrong. There's a deep seated need that people need to decode. And until we understand that, the behavior is not likely to change. Unless we deal with the belief in a way that is helpful to that child and they're able to shift their beliefs, they will not be able to to stop that behavior from happening. Because it's just like um, there is an immediate cause. You just see a child throwing tantrums or, or, or misbehaving in school or things like that. But on the surface, we see the immediate, if we try to deal with the behavior and you have not dealt with, dealt with what is beneath the surface, it's just going to come back and come back and come back again and again. So this concept is very, very powerful. And I'm gonna use four different examples to show us into uh, 
to show us what this really means. First one is undue attention. That is one of the behavior that we see. And this manifests in children, even adults. So the belief behind that behavior is that I belong only when you pay constant attention to me and or give me special service. That's the belief that the child or the person is having. But deep seated, deep down, what they're trying to communicate that they don't know how to communicate is that notice me, involve me usefully. I'll give you an example. Many a times we have children, sometimes have you been on a phone call and one of your children is just coming to you and constantly disturbing you, asking you, you questions that could have waited or trying to get your attention, disturbing you and always coming over and over or, you're, you're, or you just have a baby and the older child is coming and saying, carry me also, carry me also because suddenly you brought back a new baby from the hospital and this child is kind of like, oh, I no longer have attention that I used to have. How can I get my attention back? The child will keep coming to you and be disturbing you and you'll be, you'll be, you, it will be very annoying. Don't get me wrong. Everybody wants attention. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem occurs when a child wants undue attention. So there's this sense of urgency and persistence to the behavior that others find annoying. Parents will find it very annoying. In other words, the child is trying to seek belonging in an annoying way rather than useful way because they don't even know how to do it better. They just feel until I con as long as I continue to disturb you, you will give me the attention that I need. So the coded message is that that child wants to be noticed and that child wants you to involve them usefully. Example also in classroom, you might be a teacher, you're in a classroom and you see a particular student is all, always coming and making uh, excuses and reporting people, coming to getting your attention, disturbing the classroom and all that. That's undue attention. And you're wondering what's this child? This child is trying to say, I belong only when you pay constant attention to me. So give me something to do, give me special service. I've had that situation where a child was in the school and that child is still having, has to even leave that school because the teacher could not just understand and they would term that child as a problematic child. He's always disturbing the classroom and all that. But until that child met a teacher that understood this concept and the teacher said, okay, you know what? Come over, I'm going to give you something to do. From today, you'll be the one collecting all the papers in the classroom or you'll be the one distributing people's tests back to them. The teacher gave that child something useful to do. And to, to be honest with you, that problem was solved. Because now there's an understanding, the teacher was able to decode what the primary need was, the, the actual need of belonging of that child was. That this undue attention, the child was just trying to communicate that you need to pay constant attention to me and give me special service. Once you give that person something to do, most of the problem were solved. So that's undue attention. Then we'll look at the second one. This is misguided power. Where we see misguided power, there's always a lot of power struggle. Somebody is saying, no, I won't do that. And nobody likes somebody that's always coming to, to them, giving them demands and saying, do this, do this. If you meet a, a strong-willed person, you're going to get yourself into power struggle. So when we see that misguided power, what that child, is, the belief behind that child is that I belong only when I am the boss here. Or at least I don't let you boss me around. There are people like that. I belong only when I am the boss or I don't let you boss me around. And the deep seated need there, right beneath the surface, the, beneath the surface of the eyes is, they're trying to tell you, let me help, give me choices. As I begin to explain this concept, I'll be giving you some other tools that you can use to when you uh, notice this kind of behavior. So a child that is, uh, that is displaying misguided power, that's always uh, resisting and saying, no, I'm not going to do that. There's a power struggle there. And it takes two people to engage in power struggle. So if one person back up from power struggle, it's not going to continue. So when a child is doing that, 
one of the tools, very effective tools that you can use is to give choices. Would you rather you're in, a, in an organization, you're working somewhere and your boss is always coming, giving you all that, do this, giving you commands and just without even giving you any chance. Many people don't like that because the person will become overbearing and then we, but when another person comes and say, oh, this is what we have to do. Would you like to take this or that? It's respectful. And with that, you're going to really stop any kind of power struggle at that moment. So when a child is displaying this, uh, this, this, this behavior that we see on the surface, what they are trying to say is that I belong only when I'm the boss, but you give them options. That's a respectful, a respectful way, and they will be, most of those behavior will stop. And another example is revenge. This is really big. And I'm gonna share some, a couple of examples of with you, stories with you. So with revenge, the belief is that I don't belong and that hurts. So I will get even by hurting others. What does that mean? The deep seated need that they are trying to communicate is I am hurting, validate my feelings. The, the, the behavior that we see on the surface is revenge. And I'll give you an example of how that works. People are discouraged. Remember we said that the basis of most uh, misbehavior is discouragement. When a child is discouraged about whatever situations, circumstances they find themselves, then they have this belief that, well, this is hot. This is hurting, uh, and at least I can hurt others back. So how do we break that revenge cycle? I had the opportunity to work in schools here in Canada as an educational assistant. And uh, I, one day I was in a grade three class, in what you call a primary three class. And there was a boy, let's call him Steven. This boy was known for causing troubles in class. He will fight, he will refuse to follow instructions. He will swear in class, he will call people names. So every now and then he was being sent to the principal's office because the teacher could no longer handle that. And every time there's always need for somebody to come and uh, keep an eye on the, in the classroom because of him. And it was even beginning to influence other children in the classroom. So one of those times he, he was in the classroom, he would not do his work. You would tell him to do something. He would, was not going to do it. He will make funny sound when the teacher is trying to teach other people and those other kids will be distracted. The teacher cannot even concentrate to do her work. So he kept disrupting the classroom. He will throw things from one end of the classroom to the other end. And the teacher sent him to the office. Then I have to follow him to ensure that he went to the office. So as he stepped out of the classroom, he ran, ran out of the building and went to the back of the window of his classroom and started banging on the window. And you know with that, nobody could concentrate. Even the teachers could not concentrate. That's the level of misbehavior that that child displays. At one of those times, we have to go to the, to the church because this is a, a Catholic school and then they go to the church. The church is just a walking distance from the school. So, and the principal addressed everybody in the whole school. We're going to the church, you need to be your best behavior and things like that. And every teacher found their students and they walked to the class, to the, to, the, to the church. We were in the church and this boy got to the church. And because this is a big church with fathers, with everything, everything is already set very, cool and very um, serene environment. And then he came and he jumped on the pews, on the seat where people sit, and he started jumping with his leg from one pew to another within the church and everybody was really. So the principal signaled to some teachers, you need to get this boy out and things like that. So they had to run after him to get him. That's the level of misbehavior. And when people were going, the church was over, they were going back to class or to school, he refused to go. And the teacher said, well, could you please stay with, with him? I had to be the one to stay with him. I was just looking at him. He was sitting right on the floor. I squat in front of him, I was just looking at him, telling him whenever you're ready, I'm ready to go. We stayed there for a few minutes, then he started walking. Okay, now when we got to the school, at the point I was just making inquiries, then I realized that this boy is from a divorced home. He lives with his father and his brother. His father is alcoholic. As at that time, his brother was in jail. 
his father has issues with the police. So every now and then he kept going back and forth in the police, in the police station. So when I realized this, I was broken emotionally that this, there's more to the misbehavior of this child than what we think or we see in the surface. And how many people, how many of you listening to me today think that this particular child, that the best solution to help him stop this misbehavior is punishment? I don't know if we have the chat room. You can put it in the chat room, yes or no. If you think that the best solution to help this kind of a child is to give him punishment and that will solve the problem. Until we begin to see and understand the belief behind the behavior, we might not be able to effectively help those children to be successful. And our job as parents, our job as teacher is to be able to decode, what is this child trying to communicate with this, this behavior? What is this child trying to communicate? And now let's go to the next one. Uh, and then, and that's not, I think, um, another thing I want to mention here is that there was another grade three, isn't this a different school? A girl in a grade three class also was really very destructive in the classroom. And the teacher will always respond with time out, go outside the classroom, go and sit in the naughty, naughty corner. And there I was right there with the child. And then he was run, she was running, wanted to run around because that's what they do sometimes. And I stopped running after him, after her. And then she, she realized I was not running after her. And then she stopped. I said, okay, whenever you're ready, come and sit where your teacher said you should sit. And then she sluggishly found a way back and sat. And I was right in front of her. And then she was looking at my ring. I said, well, I like your ring. I said, oh, nice, thank you, thank you. Your mom or your dad should have one, right? And then she said, no, I don't have a mom. I don't have a dad. They both died on the same day. I'm like, oh, so sorry to hear that. Where do you live? I live with my aunt. This is a seven, eight years old girl trying to figure out life without a parent. Simply trying to cope with, with, the, with the challenges that life has thrown at her at that age. Then I was broken again. I was like, there's always something more than what we see outside. And until we decode, until we are able to know what the problem is and how to effectively help these children, we would not be able to make a successful uh, impact in their lives. Very emotional thing. You know what? Uh, our job as parents is to be able to poke, to be able to probe instead of reacting in punishment. That is our job. Another one is assumed inadequacy. What we see in the surface is a child that is discouraged and said, I give up. I'm not going to do this again. Have you been in a situation where with our children, many of, of us, we see children and we, we say, oh, you were in that classroom. How come your grade is not improving? How come you're not the first, you're not the second? How come you're, you, 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 you're coming the last or you're not even the best in your class? The people in your class, do they have two heads? Have we said that to children? I don't know how helpful those statements will be. I have probably done that in, the, in time past as well, but I'm relearning and I'm trying to use more effective methods to help our children to be successful. When you do that constantly or you compare children, can't you see this so-so-so and so-so-so child? Eh? Do they have two heads? You no, know, things like that, eh? words like that are very discouraging to children. And you might get a child that will say, okay, I give up. Even within families, we compare children to children. I say, you're not like your brother. Uh -uh, no, that is very discouraging. So some children might just give up. I say, leave me alone. I just give up. And what they're trying to tell us is that, don't give up on me. Show me small steps. Show me small steps because they are believing that it is impossible to belong, so they're giving up. Um, another example I will share here, because this helps us to drive down to its buttress and uh, improves our understanding on this concept. Uh, I picked up a job in a junior high school one time. 
which is like uh, maybe GSS2 or GSS3, as you will call it. And the primary reason the principal needed someone to bring in a needed to bring a staff was because of this grade eight girl, say maybe 14 years old. The school could no longer handle her. So she has attempted to beat up at least two teachers, two different occasions. She stood up to those teachers right in front of them, called their names, confronted them, and was at the point of beating them when people intervened. So the principal was afraid and couldn't know how to, because of this place, there's a lot of litigations and all that. He doesn't want any trouble. So he said, I can no longer, uh, I don't know what to do with this child. I'd better get somebody to, to come and watch over her. This is a girl that will always show up to the, to, in school at any time she wants. In fact, the earliest time I've seen her come to school, I saw her come to school that time was around 12 noon. That's when she was just strolling. So the principal has said that, okay, this job that I took was just for five days, right? And the principal said, this, is, this, this girl is your uh, primary responsibility when she's here. She doesn't even go to the regular classroom anymore. She has a different timetable. But whenever she shows up, I'll take her to the library and we'll, I will help her do math, do whatever she can do. She has a very scattered um, schedule and all that. So when she's not there, I'm in the other classroom supporting with mathematics, science and all that. And then one of, during that week, we had, had to go to the movies. Grade nine and grade 10 students have to go to the movie. So principal like, oh, I need somebody to really be with these girls. So my job was to, um, to keep an eye on her as she went, we went to the movie. So I was just there giving her some distance, keeping an eye on her, talk to her when I need to. If I don't need to talk to her, I just back up and things like that. So, and we went to the movie, everything was fine and we came back. I didn't even know the principal and the vice principal were watching. So then they called me and said, oh, Helen, we really appreciate how you were, you know, we were watching you. We saw how you were working with this child and all that, that, that kind of uh, uh, knowledge, how you were, we really appreciate that. You know, would you like to take a contract in this school? I'm like, oh, sure, good. And that was how I got my first contract job. So they said, okay, it's no longer for five days. Then they gave me a contract. Then I started working with her. So as at this time, I didn't even know she has attempted. I didn't even know the history of who they were assigning to me. I didn't know she has attempted to beat the teacher up. I didn't know what kind of a person she, she, she was. Then, so we started working together. And then I'll take her to the library whenever she showed up. And then I'll ask her what she wants to do. I'll help her with mathematics. And she was really behind in academics. So it was like giving up. She wasn't even going to do anything. But then I started breaking it down for her. And I tell her, because when she shows up in school, her makeup is well done. This is babe. Her makeup is well done, neatly carved. Then I'll ask you, wow, did you do this? She said, wow, you're so good. If you're able to do this, then you must be good in math. And then she will laugh. And they will continue to work together. And for long, this is a girl that could not engage. And for a long time, she will be in the library. We will walk, walking together. And the principal will be walking past. The learning coach will walk past. And they will call me. How are you working with her? We saw that she's been concentrating. How has she been able to do that? I'm like, OK, this, this, and this is what we are doing. Wow, interesting. And another day, I asked her, what do, you, what do you want to be in the future? And we started researching. And then she would write in her journals. And then she would stay there. And people were asking me, teachers, that it was then I realized that she has attempted to beat up teachers and everybody was avoiding her. But then I understood that there's a lot more to the behavior that we're seeing. I didn't even really, I didn't even know. But then when we began, when we began to work together, the people, principal were, were really impressed. She came, started coming to school a bit more often. There was no, for once, we didn't have any issue. So now what I'm trying to say is that it helps to be able to decode. We need to be a code breaker. So when a child misbehaves, think of the misbehavior as a code and ask yourself, what is she really, really trying to tell me? Remember that the child is not consciously aware of their code. They don't even know what they are doing. But when we understand them, then that is the only reason where we'll be able to influence them. So it is important for us as parents to be able to decode and to know 
what the belief behind the behavior is. And that's how we can help children to be successful. This is a very important concept. I've tried to glide over it, but I, I'm sure you get the, the, the real message. Our job is to decode. So when a child is showing in, in a, assumed inadequacy as a kind of misbehavior, what they're trying to see to say is that uh, I give up, leave me alone. But the real message is don't give up on me, show me small steps. Now, this takes us to how do parents, how do we as parents contribute to misbehavior? Because the children are not living in isolation. So one way or the other, we also as parents uh, are taking part in this misbehavior. How are we doing that? We'll look at two concepts. The first one is what I call parenting style. What is your parenting style? Now, see parenting style, this is the most um, popular, the most common parenting style that you will see when you research about it. We have the authoritarian parenting style, which is too firm. And on the other end of the continuum, we have the permissive parenting style, which is too kind. Remember I talked about kind and friend in the quote I said earlier on. And authoritative parenting style is the one that has both kindness and firmness together. And we'll look into this. So let's look at the red zone. I'll call them the red family. <clears throat> in this authoritarian home, we, there's a lot of orders that is given to children without freedom. So the, the, the parents are controlling. They have very high expectation for their kids. And some of these things are good. They have very high expectation. They said, this is what you have to do. This is the reward if you do it. If you don't do it, this is the punishment. So there's always punishment. And then they make parents make all the rules and children in this home are always fearful. So they fearfully submit to those rules. They are, all, they are always aiming to please because they want to please adults. They want to please, they want to say, oh, I've done all the rules you said, I follow them. So they are pleasers. They are what we call approval junkies. They're seeking approval from external sources. The approval is not coming from their own private logic. So it's coming from out external sources. The downside to this is that they don't feel affection and love. So they seek for that love and affection outside. Some of them when they grow up. And then they're more likely to experience depression and anxiety. They are rated, they're rated low in self-esteem compared to their counterparts in other homes. And they're less likely, they're less flexible thinkers. They're, they're rated low in creative thinking, problem solving, because of the environment in which they've grown. And then when they grow up, they are more likely to rebel. They are more likely to resist authority. So, and then they can be sneaky. Oh, I would try not to be caught because everybody's always trying to follow the rules and then and ensure that they're pleasing adults. And then on the blue side is where we have the, the home where there's a lot of freedom, but there's little or no orders. In these environments, parents are warm and nurturing. They're very responsive to the needs of the children. They give in easily. The child say, oh, I want this, I want that. Okay, go and have it. So they give in so easily. The children feel loved. So the parents really set limits and they are their children's friends. So, and kids feel very secure in those environments. Good thing is that children in this home have higher self-esteem compared to the children in the red home. They have higher self-esteem because it's, there's love, they feel secure. Right, those are good things. They may perform poorly in the academics and in, in, in life because there's less expectation. There's no so much high expectation for them. Then they lack boundaries. They grow up to be entitled adults. They grow up to be entitled, always wanting things to be done for them. They want, they demand things. They grow up to be entitled and they're likely to walk over their parents because they don't fear their parents unlike the red home. And growing up, some of them are likely to experience with alcohol, alcohol and drugs and all that because they've lacked self-discipline. And let's look at authoritative home, which is the purple. When you mix a bit of red and blue, you get purple. So right in the middle is both kind and femme parenting. 
how do we do that? This is not about shifting from a oh, red zone today, blue zone tomorrow. That's not what it means. There are principles, there are ways in which you will be both kind and firm at the same time. Not that today I'm authoritarian, tomorrow I'm permissive, no. We have to be both kind and firm at the same time. In this kind of home, they set limits with reason. There's still expectation, but there's always reason to back it up so children understand. So children are treated with dignity and respect in this kind of home. So there is joint problem solving. Nobody is an island of knowledge. Nobody is the one that is dictating what happens. Everybody contributes. So children in this environment are likely to thrive in life. They feel the deep sense of connection. Remember the word connection that we highlighted earlier on. They feel that deep sense of connection and belonging. They have valuable life skills. They are self-disciplined people and they're responsible. So our parenting style will determine and affect the kind of behavior that we see and the kind of children that we raise as we grow, as they grow up. So every one of us, we can begin to say, where did I belong? Where do I fall? I know where I, where, where I belong. I used to be in the red zone, even though my husband used to, is kind of like in the blue zone, but we are trying to find ourselves in the purple right now. So we all need to really self do reflection and think about it and see what we need to, be, to do to make sure our children are successful. Another concept I want to share with us is lifestyle priorities. So what are lifestyle priorities? These are subconscious decisions that we make from childhood that we, we, we think that shows how we find belonging and significance. This is free, we, from our childhood. Your children are making their own right now in the home they're growing up. You made your home where you grew up from. I made my own where I grew up from. So these are our lifestyle priorities, and it's a um, combination of the decisions we've made as we grew. So there are different lifestyle priorities of so comfort, control, pleasing, superiority. I will look into that in the next slides. So lifestyle priorities may invite certain decisions and behavior from children. This does not tell exactly who we are, but it just shows the, the um, decisions we have made over time. And that is what will influence how we try to find belonging and significance, if we understand what I mean. So let's look at them in more detail. The comfort power uh, uh, lifestyle. There's always assets and liabilities for each of those lifestyle priorities. And then I'll also share some of the things we need to practice instead. For comfort, the good asset of that is that the model for children, the benefit of being easygoing. A, comfort a person that has a comfort lifestyle priority is easygoing, they're very diplomatic, they're predictable, they enjoy simple pleasures. So those are possible assets of that priority. Let's look at the liability of somebody that has a comfort as a lifestyle priority. They are permissive. And this may invite children to be spoiled and demanding. And this is something close to the blue home that we just shared. So they're very permissive parents. So they, they are more in their interest in comfort than the need of the situation. They just don't want trouble. They just want comfort. So they are more interested in comfort than the need of the situation. What should they do in order to help children to be successful? How can we make changes? Creating routines will help setting goals, involving problem solving, uh, involving children in problem solving. That will help teaching life skills, allowing children to experience the natural consequences of their choices. Doing family meetings, very, very effective. I'll share a little bit of family meetings as we go on. So you might begin to look at yourself, where do I belong? I know where I belong, I'll still continue to share. Now, the second lifestyle priority is control. Oh, I want to share an example. So if, for instance, uh, there's a belief that somebody believes that I am little, others are big. So how would the person with comfort uh, lifestyle react to this? They will say to themselves, I am little, others are big. Therefore, I must get others to take care of me. They just want comfort. They just want them to be taken care of. They don't want any stress. So I will get others to take care of me. It sounds like that. 
then the one with control priority, the possible asset is that they may teach children organizational skill, which is very great. Leadership skills, productive, persistence, assertiveness, respect for law and orders, time management skills. So these are good things that people with control a priority teach their children. But liabilities include being rigid, very controlling. You might invite rebellion and resistance from children or unhealthy pleasing. They just want to please. I don't want to trouble. I just want to please. So that's unhealthy please. I want children to grow up to be, to be pleasing people. When they grow up to be adults, when they have to stand their feet, they cannot do that because they're so used to pleasing. So things like that. So those are priorities. What should they do instead? They may need to practice letting go, offering choices. We mentioned it earlier. It's very important. Asking curiosity questions. These are tools that we can use. Involving children in decision-making and having a family meeting. These are good tools. So an example is still the same statement. I am little, others are big. So a person with control lifestyle priority will say, therefore, I must maintain control of myself and the situation so I don't feel humiliated. That's the person with control. And then a lifestyle priority of pleasing. There are people like that, pleasing. So um, the possible asset of that, they may help children learn to be friendly, considerate, and non-aggressive. They're peacemakers compromisers and their volunteers. They will volunteer for everything. They're very good and very friendly. The possible asset of that is that they're more likely to be treated as doormats. They keep scores. Now you hold me, I've done this to you. You have to do for me as well. You hold me now. They may invite resentment, depression, and they may have depression or revenge, things like that. But what are the tools they can use? They need to practice having faith in children to solve their own problems. Joint problem solving is very important. Emotional honesty. When you're tired, you're tired. Tell, be able to say, I am tired. Learn to be honest emotionally and learn to give and to take. Don't, you don't always have to give every time without taking. It's also good to take. So also practicing family meetings will be helpful. And also the last one, uh, I will talk about lifestyle priority, superiority. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say the statement. So when a person with pleasing priority, when you, there's a statement like, I am little, others are big, then they will say, therefore, I must please others, so I will be loved. Okay. Lifestyle priority is of superiority. So the possible asset of that is that we model success in achievement because these people are very, they have this superiority uh, lifestyle power to so teach children to assess quality and motivate them to excellence. So possible abilities that we might be lecturing people to, to children, we expect too much from them. We invite feelings of inadequacy because when you expect too much at some point children can start to feel oh, I'm inadequate and failure to measure up. So they see things in terms of right and wrong instead of possibilities. So they're just either this way or that way. So what we need to do is to practice letting go of the need to be right. Sometimes we don't have, always have to be right. Getting into the child's world and supporting the need and, um, and the goals. Showing unconditional love, enjoying the process and developing a sense of humor will be helpful. Having family meetings is always helpful, okay? So where all people's ideas are valued, we don't always have to be the only right person. So all these priorities, according to the Jewish psychologists that developed this, affect how children turn out and what, they, what, what come, becomes of them. So we might be able to see, identify where we belong and how we need to make some adjustments to help our children to be successful. Now, why is it important for us to mend relationships? Children are misbehave when they are discouraged, when the relationship is broken. So it is important because of the mandate that God has given us that we have to train up a, the children in the way that they should go. When they are older, they will not depart from it. So for us to be able, this is a, a mandate of influence. For us to be able to influence our children, we need to mend relationships. 
you know? So if you reduce controlling behavior and we improve relationship, then we'll be able to have greater influence. It doesn't matter if you talk from now to tomorrow, if the relationship is broken, if the child is discouraged, it will come in one ear and go out in the other. So for us to be able to have greater influence in the lives of our children, we must be able to improve that relationship. It's very key. That's the connection piece that we're talking about. Now, uh, we'll begin to share some tools, but before we do that, let's look at this. Because this is one of the, um, one of the baseline activities that we do when we do workshops. We'll try to see what are the now challenges that we are facing? What are the challenges that we face today? If I begin to ask us to tell us the challenges that you're facing your parenting, either your children are still uh, young or they are now teenagers, it will fall in line. This has been tried and tested. Either you're in North America, you're in Africa, wherever you are, the problems that parents face are almost the same. These are the challenges we'll, we'll, we'll see today. Well, let's look at, we invite, when we do this activity, we invite parents to look at a, a time in the future. Assuming, look at your child right now as a 30 year old adult and the child comes home to you. The question we ask is, what kind of adult do you wish to see? What kind of a child adult do you wish to see? And big people will start to mention the lifestyle uh, priorities and characteristics and life skills. They say we want them to be, have communication skills, problem solving skills, self motivate motivation to learn. They have good work ethics, sense of humor, happy, healthy, self esteem. You know they're very curious. They respect others. Things like that. We have very good uh, you know, characteristics that we want to see in the lives of the children. But today we're seeing those challenges. How do we take ourselves from now challenges to the future? Then we need a bridge that will take us from where we are right now to where we hope to be in the future. Like Stephen Covey say, he said, begin with the end in mind. That's what we try to do with this. We try to project the end or like when our children are adult, they are no longer under us. What kind of adult do we want to see? We don't want approval junkies. We want people that are able to add their own opinion and, and change mindsets if possible. We don't want children that will be changed. You know, things like that. So how do we take our children from these now challenges of they're not listening, they're backbiting, or they use foul language, they don't do homework, bedtime, they're lying, stealing, cheating, fighting, all those things that we see today. Media addiction, how do we take those children from today with those challenges and move them to where we want them to be in the future? And this will determine will be where you will bring them in the future was determined by the amount, by the type of tools that you use in your parenting. Like many other jobs, you, are, you have to be trained to be the best, to be skillful in what you're doing. But parenting is what people think, oh, I know what's, what is good. My parent did this to me, I must do. Many at times we, we, we model the kind of parenting that our parent did. And we have never taken time to break it down and say, what was the result of this kind of parenting? And how can we inform ourselves better? So until we begin to choose our tools effectively, because we have our goal in our mind where we want our children to be. So we, the good thing about positive discipline is that you can take all of these challenges, apply the right tools and help you to land your kids where you want them to be. So how do we take, we need to take them from point A to point A, point B with this bridge and that determines tools and, as, uh, and strategies that we use. So I'll be sharing some of the tools, some of them we have shared in, in the course of this presentation. I will also tell us a few more that we can use to effectively help our children to be successful in life. So tools for su success, see it as a, a toolbox. Many of us have toolbox or tool bag at home where you have your plier, chisel, all those things, hammer and things like that. Your parenting, so you need to have tools. If I begin to ask, what kind of tools do you have in your parenting toolbox? It's not only punishment that should be there, but I'm sure some of us have encouragement. We have those encouraging words and things like that that we use. So let's share some of the tools for success. One of the things this is very, very key, connection before correction. 
you might want to jot it down, correction, connection before correction. So before we are able, before we begin to attempt to correct a child, we must make connection. Because if you don't make that connection, that correction most times is not effective. So we need to create closeness and trust instead of distance and hostility by making sure that the message of love gets through. So we are more likely to be successful if we use, do that. Okay, so you can tell a child, if a child is struggling academically and you want to motivate them, we, instead of comparing that child to other children and saying, what are you thinking of in class? Why, why did you fail this exam? And things like that. You can just call the child in a very friendly atmosphere when there's no tension and tell the child, you're more important to me than your grades. If you tell a child that, you've already made connection with that child. You're more important to me than your grades. Then you ask them a question. What do your grades mean to you? And let them talk. This is just an example. What do your grades mean to you? But you are more important to me. Because sometimes kids think it's all about grades, great grades that you're. <laughs> but we need to be able to show that it's much more than that. I'm important. And we mean well for our children. Parents, we, we love them and we mean well for them, but sometimes we don't know how to effectively pass this message across. So connecting with our children before we attempt to make correction is really very helpful. Another way we can do that is to show faith in the child. Tell the child, I have faith in you that you'll be able to solve that problem. That is encouraging. I have to start to learn all these things myself. Because if I say, oh, why did you fail this? Didn't you say you make silly mistake in your test? I was, or you're trying to solve a problem. You don't know it. I'm like, I have faith. I have confidence in you that you're able to do that. And with that, the child relaxes and the child is able to now engage their rational brain and to start to think and look for solution. I had a situation of a child that was stealing. We went to the store where, where you call supermarket and pick things. And one day it's been going on and the mother had to call the child when nobody was at, at home, nobody was there in a quiet place and asked the child to come and sit on, his, on her lap and said, and, you, and they're not asking, what did you do? The question is, because you already know what the child did. So you don't go there so that you don't give opportunity for the child to be defensive. You just said, I realized this, this, this happened. Do you know how many of do, and the child said, yes, I, I took it, yeah, because it's this, they have a lot in the store. They have a lot of candy or sweets in the store. I have to take one. And the child, the parent has to explain, do you know how many of these little sweets or candy that these spirit people need to sell before they are able to gather enough money to pay their staff, to pay for the rents, to make gain, to take care of their families, sat down and explained all those things to that child. And the child said, wow. I've never seen it in that way. And do you think it would be good to be picking things when you, you don't have money to buy? I said, no. And with that, the parent is able to say, I have faith in you that next time you won't do that. Now you have understanding. So with this, we're able to, to help to make connection before we attempt to make a correction. This is very key. Also family meeting, I've mentioned it a couple of times, is very effective. Apart from our devotional time, having family meeting is very, very um, key, very, very important tool that we can use to help children develop valuable skills. So it provides opportunity for children to develop valuable social and life skills for good character. In family meeting, there's always, we can, we can teach about family meeting within one hour because there's a lot of components about it but you give uh, is, is in the atmosphere where you do it and what it's included and what you shouldn't use family meeting for. When you do that, children will learn listening skills, brainstorming skills, problem solving skills. They will learn concern for others. They will, they will cooperate. And you have to make it regular, have regular family meeting. If there's any challenges at home, you ask children to put it on the family meeting agenda, waiting for the next time we'll have family meeting. And that's time is where you now do a brainstorming session where no idea is stupid. Let them be able to contribute. What do you think we can do to solve this problem? It might be a particular problem with a particular child, but you're doing it in a loving atmosphere. 
that's you're able you're helping children to practice listening skills you're helping them to brainstorm you're helping helping them to practice problem solving skills this is very very useful every family should be having it and uh also i want to also leave you with these uh strategies called how to win cooperation how to win cooperation with our children first of all you want to express understanding for the child's feeling So be sure to check with that child that you, what, what you're, you're proposing is right. Just tell them, I understand how you feel about that. Oh, your teacher shouted on you in the classroom. Oh, I understand how you felt about that. And then secondly, you show empathy without condoning. How do you show empathy without condoning? Empathy does not mean that you agree or condone what the child has done. These are ways in which you can be both firm and kind at the same time. Empathy simply means that you understand the child's perception. Sometimes we need to put ourselves in the mindset of a child. So one of the things we ask our parents to do is to look back to when they were that age. What will you be thinking, feeling or deciding to do as a nine-year-old, as a seven-year-old? Because sometimes we have grown up to be adults and we have forgotten what it is like to become, to be a child. So we can't think, we can't reason with them. We cannot uh, uh, have understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. We are looking at it from our own mindset, from our own adult brain. But it's good for us sometimes to, to see from a child's perspective. So most time, if, if so I said, okay, show empathy without condoning. And the third one is share your own feelings and perception. Share your own feelings and perception. Most times, if the first two have been done correctly, in a sincere and friendly manner, then you will have a, you have created a connection already and the child will be more ready to listen to you. Many times when we correct children and they don't want to listen to us because we have not connected with them. So you make that connection first before we try to correct. So it's sharing your feelings. Oh, but what you did, I didn't really, you have also acknowledged the child's feeling, then you now share your own feeling. This is how it made me feel as a parent. I didn't really feel quite good that you did that. I let them know. But because you have already asked them, show understanding for their own feeling, you have shown empathy, you have not condoned what they have done, you have built that connection. They are more likely to listen to you when you now start to talk. The concept of, of uh, building connection without uh, before correction is very, very effective and we need to practice how to do that. And number four is that we now have to invite the child to focus on the solution and ask if the child has any idea in the future on how to avoid this kind of problems. And if he doesn't have an idea, this is an opportunity for you as parents to now see, this is what I would suggest, this is what I would suggest. And then you ensure that you both agree on solution and then you can now take it forward from there. This is, this is four steps for winning cooperation with children. It's very, very, very effective, okay? So an attitude of friendliness is very important when we are doing this because you can go through those four steps and the attitude, the atmosphere is like blaming and shaming. That's not going to be helpful. So the attitude of friendliness, caring and respect are essential when you're doing these steps. So with that, you'll be able to create connection and that will be enough to, 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 to create positive feelings for that child and for you. And then you will be able to influence that child to make the better decisions. So um, to wrap it all, I'll be sharing just nuggets of strategies, just a final thoughts about what we need to do. So and what we need to do and what we, we need to avoid. First of all, avoid giving and taking back stuff. That's like, oh, you did this, I'm going to seize this from you. Well, when you're correcting, the correction has to be uh, one age appropriate related to what is happening and has to be communicated ahead of time. Okay, we don't take technology to our rooms in the night. You shouldn't have any phone, any iPad or anything in the room, for example. And you tell them this is our rule for, the, for our house. So if you do that, that means you won't have technology for the next two days or for the next one week, depending on what you want to say. You understand? The child says yes, understood. And then you give them room to make their own choices. 
And once they make their own choice, if a child now uh, comes back and flouts that rule, then you must stand your ground and apply that consequences that you have agreed upon. That's how to be firm and kind at the same time. But if you just say, oh, I'm seizing that thing, the child can be discouraged, but there are better ways in which we can do that. Also, listen and ask. This is very good for relationship building. Listen and ask. Sometimes we say children don't listen, but even we adults, sometimes we don't listen to children. So it's good to listen and ask. And then remember what it was like when you were their age. That's what I just said in the earlier slide. Let's remember with that, we'll be able to assess our own hearts and see, make that connection and think from their own perspective. So it can help us to choose a more effective way in handling those misbehaviors. Also, avoid making success in school a measure of your love. Don't say, oh, if you don't do this, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to buy this. That should not be the measure of our law for our children. So the success in school is good. will encourage them to have high expectation to be successful. But if a child has performed less, does not mean um, we love them less. Practice problem solving and solution rather than making demands. That's when you say, okay, what do you think? I have their own opinion. And, and you still have the final say and you have to give them reason. This is why I think this is the best solution. So you encourage problem solving and then you give a um, solution. Um, lastly, don't neglect laughter and play. Use humor. It's very important to, to make everybody feel comfortable, make everybody feel uh, encouraged to be able to listen to what you want to say. Please, not every time that I've it will end up with laughter and play. A child might do, do something that's really very annoying and it's okay for you to be annoying. It's okay, you just say, I really feel this way. I really don't like it. Let them know that. But as time goes on, when everything cools off, cools off you can now find a time to make, it, um, make humor out of it and it will be successful. And then be the role model your kids needs. That's my final words. And I think that should be all that I have. So yes, Parenting Grace, feel free to connect with us on Facebook and Instagram, and those are handles. So I'm open to take questions if we have questions from anybody. Thank you so much, Ma, for the beautiful session. So we are going to ask people to ask their questions either by the chat section or they raise their hands. So that's how we are going to do it. So if it's by the chat section, I'll send it to you, Ma, and you'll see it. And then if anybody has, they will raise up their hand and they will talk to you, Ma. Okay. okay. I'm trying to bring up the chat. Do I need to stop sharing? Okay, I have the chat. We have a hand that's raised and she's going to call me now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, yes thank you very much. Thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. Uh, You're welcome. I appreciate your time. And Thank you. I must say, it's really, really, even though I joined late, I actually can testify that I had some tips that I can also work with. I was to just bring you to speed with regards to when you want to strike a balance between when children start to get to adolescent, getting to teenage, uh, age and when they want to kind of be assertive and kind of hold on to their rights, try to gain that freedom whereby they want to express themselves. How do you strike the balance between that stage of their growth with regards to them overdoing it? Okay. To, to you know, to the extreme. So okay. I want you to, to see if you get my question. I hope am I clear? 
I, I think I got your questions like when children are becoming teenagers and they have their own mindset and they want to do things yes. their own way. Yeah. And how do you strike a balance? You still yeah. Want um, to yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, when children get to that age when they are teenagers, of course they are they are becoming they are individuating, meaning that they are discovering themselves. They are now understanding logic. They understand. Uh, cause and effect a little bit. And then they want to make their own decisions at that point. So at that point as parents, that's not the time to, so your, our role as a parent at that point is the role of being a coach. If when they were growing before they were, when they were still um, twin, when they were still like um, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and that's the time where we are doing a lot of uh, discipline, a lot of uh, correction, a lot of things. We're putting still values in them and all that. But when they're getting to the teenagers, our role should be shifting to become a coach. In that way, you want to practice some of the tools that we have said here. One thing is you want to hear them out. There's no teenager that will love somebody to always, 100% of the time, dictate to them what they should do and how they should go about it. And they have something different. So you remember our job is to influence them. Now, if we must influence them, we must first of all make that connection. So when we are at the point where they are saying this and we are saying this and there's this power struggle, we cannot influence them and they will not listen. So one of the things we can do is using the tool that we have shared. One of those ones is family meetings. For instance, uh, my daughter wants to go to school. She needs to catch a bus. She's 12 years old. And uh, maybe one or two times she, she missed the bus because I try not to, I try to help her to develop responsibility for herself. I can just remind her, oh, this is how much you have left, be careful. I won't pack your bag for you. I will do my own things. If it's my own job to get your food ready, I'll get your food ready. But it's your job to dress up and go and meet your boss on time. I'm trying to teach you responsibility. If she, if assuming she's missing her bus one, two, three, four times, what I would do instead of scolding and coming and telling her, oh, you did this, why should you do? You always miss it, but I'm not going to drop you again. Things, I won't do that. Um, and depending on the situation at hand, my daughter has had to miss her bus and she, had to, she has trekked to school before. At some point, my husband met her midway and took her to school, but we're trying to teach her to be responsible. That has really stopped. Now, what I'm saying is that if you, you assuming you have that kind of problem, what you can do is to say, hmm, I observe that you have been come going late to you know you've been missing your bus lately is that a problem about that do you think we need to talk about it and then you can say let's put it on family uh meeting agenda you have a family we have one that we stick on the fridge if there's an issue we'll just go and write it there we don't address it right away put it on family meeting agenda and when it's at that time we'll sit together and we say okay let's brainstorm how can any be going to school without uh, running late with how can she meet her boss on time this is a very friendly atmosphere. This is not blaming, shaming, or anything. And then everybody starts to come. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe you need to pack things in the night. Maybe you can do this. Maybe you need to set a timer, things like that. So we brainstorm all those ideas. And as we do that, we say, okay, which one do you want to go with? She choose one, and then we go. That's more effective than to scold, to lecture, to blame, to shame, and all that. If we do that, we'll break that connection. If we do that, I remember our job is to influence them for, for God, but so that they will be who God has wanted them to be. So we must be careful in the way we do it. So it's not a time where we can just, uh, and when they are overbearing, when they're, they're, they're not reasonable in their, in their approach or in the, what their suggestions are, that's when we come in and we now come with explanation and say, oh, I don't think that will work. This is the reason why that will not work. But this is, I said, oh, I'm trying to teach you this. I don't think that approach will be helpful. So you tell them the reason. Always come with, this is what I think you should do. And this is the reason why I said this should not happen. And one of the things, my daughter, she's 12. She doesn't have a smartphone. Since she's in grade seven right now, since she was in grade four, there are people in her classroom that had phones. And every time she'll come to me, everybody have phone, everybody. Like, yeah, this is the reason why I think it's not right for you to have phone. Every family is different. Somebody might say, okay, my kids are ready and give them. But I think 
this is what I believe. This is why I said no for you for now. When it's time, you will have it and you will thank me later. Things like that. So having that con connection, talking to them about it and explaining the reason behind what we're saying will help us to be successful. I hope I've not spent so much time on that question. Yeah. I hope I'm, I answered your question, Sister Diola. Okay, Ma, we have some questions in the chat I've sent to you, Ma, about three of them, Ma. Oh, okay. I have a question. Okay, let me see which one is the first one here. Can I have, okay. At what age can one have a children room? I mean that you can allow them to sleep in their own room. Well, as long as you know that the child can sleep in their room without any trouble all through the night. Um, some kids, some people put their kids in their own room, maybe when they're one year old and they, they go check them every now and then. So as if you know that there's nothing at stake, you putting that child alone in that room, there's no danger, there's nothing at stake. The child is able to sleep all through the night then you can put the child there maybe as early as one, two years old, depending on you. And then, so I think, and that's my answer for, for that, except a child that needs attention, maybe you need to wake them up, then you can wake up from your room, go to their room and uh, take them to the washroom if they need to go to the bathroom and use it and then bring them back and go back to sleep in your room. So as early as you think, oh, there's nothing at stake, they are able to sleep without any issue, you can, you can let them. Another question is, at what age can one have, uh, I think that's the one, same, same question. I have a question, what is the need asking for your children's opinion when you're still going to do what you think is best? Won't the child feel discouraged bringing his or her opinion? Good question, good question. When you ask for children's um, opinion, um, it's not every time that what you you your own has to be the the final say, and it all depends on what we are talking about. There are some um, there are some conditions, there are some situations where you have to put your feet down and say, "Oh, for this these reasons, this is what has to be done." As long as you are giving your children explanation why you're thinking we should go with this option they will be fine. The problem is when we don't give them explanation, we just say, because I said so, this is what we must do. That's not encouraging. But you ask them for their opinion. And one thing is that there's something we call boundary. I will use an, try to use an example to illustrate it. You, 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 you have a boundary and then you give options within that boundary. Example is if oh, my child has have their, their bath and they, okay, now let me use a bit different example. The child needs to do homework. Homework needs to be done before dinner, okay? Before you have supper, homework needs to be done. That is your boundary. Your boundary, your, your, the choices you are now asking those kids is like, oh, your homework needs to be done before dinner. Would you like to do it at five o'clock or six o'clock? Which one do you think works for you? With that, you're still in control of what needs to be done. That has been firm. Being kind is within that boundary. You are now giving options, but options is not outside of the boundary. Within the boundary, you're giving options, but you have the boundary which is determined by you. So that is when that comes in place. And because, so you give boundary on things that are not so important. Uh, you give uh, options on things that which, whether, whichever one they take, it will still have to be done. So you're empowering them to be in control, in charge of their own life. Say, okay, I'm the one that choose when I want to do it. But you are the one that's setting the boundary that homework needs to be done. Then, because if you just say, go and do your homework, and you have to do it now. The child might, might not, some children will do, depending on the temperament of the child, some children will really struggle with that. But a better tool to use is to give limited choices. We call it limited choices. You say, this is the boundary. What would you like to do? Oh, you can visit your friend. Would you like to go on a Friday evening or a Saturday? 
we can't go outside of those two days too. So that's what I'm saying. So as parents, they are, we still have to put our feet down on those crucial decisions because kids don't understand cause and effect and they will not understand the reason why you're given the boundaries. You understand better, that's why you're a parent. So that one has no negotiation, but within that, you can give some limited choices that will be empowering to those children. Okay, and then, um, okay. Yes, I have a, and so the children will not feel discouraged because you're giving explanation, reasons why you have chosen that to back it up and you let them understand. They might not like it, but it won't be a big issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's been said that people tend to parent their children the way they were brought up. How do we separate ourselves from that to put this parenting method into place? It's just what I've been saying. We have to learn and relearn. Um, nobody is an island of, of, of knowledge. Nobody knows it all. We can say, and it's really, uh, we can say, uh, my parent uh, parented this way. I have to. One, times are changing. We're in a different time. We remember where it used to be a lot of autocratic rule and governance in, in different countries. You see that the, uh, the militaries are in power. Everybody must obey the rule, things like that. But now we're becoming more democratic, even in governance in different nations, we're becoming more de democratic. In organization, they are becoming more democratic. And uh, at home too, if we still want to be that uh, military autocratic and uh, very controlling, it's not going to be so much effective. But within that, we need to put it in the context of the world we are living in right now and say, oh, if my parents did this, that it, it might be effective for them. Is it still effective for me right now? And we need to also improve our own knowledge and study and research and say, well, what is, people have done a lot of studies and research on this. What is, what has, have they seen? What is the pattern? Until we begin to educate ourselves, we will not know better. So then, I, because my parents beat me when I was growing up, for example, at some point before I uh, improved my knowledge, I used to beat my children. But I hardly do that now because what? I have other tools I can use before it won't get to. Beaten. Until I have tried all other tools and I realized that, oh, this is no beating is now the, uh, I haven't seen, I have tried different tools. I give them consequences for their decisions, for their actions. But we need to look at what our parent did because sometimes we don't realize, some people will say, oh, this is what my parent did, I turned out right. What is your definition of turn out right? We need to really shed more light on that. What are the areas we're still struggling with? Creativity, for example, problem solving. Sometimes we can't face people, authority, and talk to them strictly because we we're not brought up that way. When I got my job in the oil and gas industry, it was difficult for me to call my bosses by name. These are people that are white people. I, I have to look, and I almost would want to kneel down. That's my culture, which is good. It's fine. But there are some things that I have to learn based on my upbringing. Some other people that were brought up in other homes too, find no difficult, have no problem doing those things. But I struggled a bit in certain areas. You, sometimes you struggle with self-esteem. Sometimes you're shy and things like that. So there, are, these are results of how we've been parented and things that, we, so we need to look at it critically and say, what are the advantages? There are very, very good advantages of the way our parents brought us up that help us to be industrious, to, to, to know how to work, to do all this. There are other things that we think we can improve on. It's by improving our knowledge about it. Okay, I think. I able to, I'm just looking at time as well as we answer this question. Yeah, so how do you separate yourself from that to put this parenting method? So it's by improving our knowledge, learning what to do and what not to do. Sometimes we, we have very limited tools in our toolbox. Remember the toolbox I shared? We have very limited tools. We need to improve our knowledge and increase in, and add many more other tools that our parents might not have used, that we think is more effective and all that. So we put those things into, in, add it to our, uh, our list and then we'll be able to be successful. And then what else can be done for, or what counsel can you give to an 
authoritative, kind, and firm parents trained, and always erring child, and the child is still refusing to be good ambassador of the home and Christ. I hope I understand that question. Yeah, you, first of all, I need to, we need to understand what you do, what you call kind and firm, because I've just really scratched this concept on the surface. We haven't really um, go into depth on what is it, is it in practice, what it is in practice to practice firm and kind parenting. Sometimes, or oh, we think, oh, we are doing firm and kind parenting. How is that translating in everyday activity, in every day? What do we do when we have this particular problem? How, what, what, how do you make sure that it is both firm and kind? So, because this is a broad concept. So until we have done all that and we see that, oh, still this is not working, then we can look at it. And another thing I would say, we are all Christians here, I believe. So the place of prayer is very, very, very important. We can't overemphasize that. These tools are great. Just that we will not do one and leave the other. We cannot only pray and then we, we are not skillful. Even when God was giving people in the book of Genesis, I think Exodus was given uh, people that will build the temple. He said they should look for people that are skillful. How much more building the life of children that God has committed to our hand? We should be skillful in it. Even God will not allow somebody that is not skillful to build his temple for him. So the skillful part is where we get our knowledge. We improve our parenting skills. We do all that to improve our, we still pray. That does not replace the place of prayer. And that does not mean that that's the only thing we will do. We will not pray about it. So we have to be, do both together. You do all you can do, improve your own parenting styles and how you handle those children. And then you pray about it. I'm sure with time, there will be success, but it won't happen overnight. It won't happen overnight. It will, it's a process and God will help us. Thank you. I think that's the last question. Yes, ma, that's the last question. So we, are, as you have said, we are going to end this meeting with some prayers because after all is said and done, we still need the help of God. I want to thank you, ma, for all that you have taught us tonight. God bless you. I was really blessed and I'm sure every participant in this seminar was can, can testify that they were blessed. Retrospect is everything yeah. and it's really eating us hard that we have a lot of work to do. So let's begin to pray this evening. Thank God for this beautiful opportunity given to us. Let's thank God because he is a faithful God. Yes, let's worship him. Let's adore him. The Bible says that in all your getting, get wisdom, get understanding. And this is why we are here tonight. We've come to learn at the master's feet through his servant, and we are asking God to equip us with the wisdom, the knowledge that would help us to train our children in the way that they are supposed to go. I want us to pray that the Lord God will give us the templates. Last year, Matrimonial Healings Week was all about templates. Let us pray that the Lord will give us the templates we need to raise each child. She said it all, each child is different. I want us to pray for the wisdom of God. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help you to be your partner in parenting your child. Even if you are single and you're still waiting on God, I want you to say, Father, help me when I start the parenting journey. May you help me. May I never do this on my own. Let's pray for grace. Let's receive grace. Let's receive grace to do this thing called parenting. And I want us to pray tonight that the Lord God will help us that all that we have learned tonight will be used by us. We will not be those people that hear the word. James said that anybody that looks at himself in the world and walks away without doing is a foolish person. Let us begin to rebuke the spirit of foolishness. We will not be foolish parents. We will not be foolish. We will not mishandle our children. We would obey. We will learn. We will do the things that the Lord has for us. Our facilitators say we need training. We not just think that parents are just about giving birth. We have to be trained. In Jesus' name we are praying. And as we round up, we are going to ask the Lord God to help us as parents that in all that we do, we are not just raising trophies so that we can say, my child is well behaved, my child is the best. No, we are raising, we are raising kingdom generals. All that we are doing is for the glory of the Lord. I want you to say, Father, all my children, they are for you. Everything they will be in the future, 
we saw the list of all that we want to see in the future everything the child that can communicate well that has work ethic that is brilliant that is that that is cultured that understand people they all will end up with the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, for the purposes of God. Pray for your child. If you are single, lay your hand upon your womb and say, My child, you will fulfill purpose for God in the name of Jesus. As we end, I want us to lift up Mrs. Fumi Alagbe. I want us to cover her with the blood of Jesus. She is doing a great and mighty work with parenting grace. And I want to say, Father, she will not be someone that will labor on others and our own will be in vain. No, she will reap the fruit of her labors. Her children will be for God's glory. She, they, will, they will stand strong in this generation. Let's, I want you to just pray for her as you have been blessed tonight. You are not just talking to just an invited girl. You are talking to someone that has labored in school of virtue. This is the year of the Lord's Harvest. She was the former SOV captain in OAU, in University uh, Obafemi Awolowo University. I want to say, Father, let all our labors, let this year, let her have harvest. She has been laboring. Let her receive harvest too in the name of, in her family, in her children. Some of the things we do while we are serving God, they are not for us. They are for our children. I want us to pray for all our children that she will see the harvest of all that she has done. Even tonight, she will have harvest from this meeting. She will see it. It will be glaring. She will tell Pastor Shagunda, yes, I saw this harvest. Father, we thank you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Thank you, everybody. Father, we give you praise for tonight. We ask the Lord, let your spirit take control and have your way in all that we have done. Help us as we come back tonight to pray. We pray for the spirit of prayer and intercession to fall upon us. If some people have missed every other session, we pray that this prayer meeting at 8 p.m. for the family, they will not miss it in the name of Jesus and their miracle will be delivered to them. We pray every child that this season they will be called back by the prodigal son. They will come to themselves by the help of the Holy Spirit and they will come back to you, O oh God. And they will see their parents and their parents will receive them with unconditional love in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for in Jesus' name we are afraid. We want to thank you to everyone who has joined us on Zoom, on YouTube, on MixLR. Thank you so much for being a part of the Matrimonial Healing Week 2021. It has been amazing. Tonight is the grand finale. In a few hours, by 8 p.m., we're going to be gathering at the throne of grace with prayer and intercession. We are going to ask the Lord to intervene. And the, and the theme of this prayer is that this marriage must work. One of the things that was eating me as I was sitting down here was retrospect. I said, I have no reason to offer my children a kind of upbringing. I have to do better. And that's why we must pray. And that I want to invite you. Please invite your friends, invite your neighbors and say, your marriage must work. It doesn't matter if you are single. And so we'll see you. Ministry tonight is Pastor Shego and Mrs. Shalakokoka. Please join us in eight, by 8 p.m. And we'll pray and we know. SOV, we know that God answers prayer. Thank you so much for joining us. See you at 8 p.m. tonight. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Anomaly